Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma, the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And we have a fantastic episode for you guys today. Uh, a little bit of level setting. Um, if it seems like there were some cuts in the podcast, there were. Uh, we had um, someone unexpected crash the studio halfway through recording. Uh, Ron DeSantis was actually in the building. We got to talk to him a little bit. Uh, he doesn't appear on the podcast itself, but I think on YouTube we'll throw up a picture here of uh, of us talking to to the big guy. He's uh, he's doing well. He's making moves, and uh, we're excited to to do stuff with him moving forward as well. But um, without further ado, I want to talk a little bit about the guests that we're going to have on American Moments, a Moment of Truth this week. We have on Sam Hammond. Now Mr. You, ham and cheese himself. On Twitter, he is <laughs> ham and cheese. He's the lunchable of the Moment of Truth podcast. Um, Sam Hammond is the director of poverty and welfare policy at the Niskanen Center. Now, you may say Niskanen. Those are those crunchy neoliberal uh, libertarian types. And it's true. Uh, but Sam's actually pretty great. And he's pretty interesting. You may not agree with everything you hear from him today, but he brings a perspective to everything from poverty and welfare to industrial policy and tech that we think is sorely needed. He previously worked as an economist for the government of Canada, specializing in rural economic development, and is graduate research fellow for the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. As you can tell, very much a reformed libertarian. Uh, his research focuses on the effectiveness of cash transfers in alleviating poverty and how free markets can be complemented by robust systems of social insurance. I think we had a good time talking to him. We, we shot the breeze a little bit. We're buddies with Sam out here in Washington, D.C., and he has a really interesting, I think, well-formed perspective on all things poverty, welfare, social safety net, and, and how to build a, a just regime in general. Uh, he comes from a fundamentally different perspective than I think Nick and I do. You know, we're you know, hard charging religious social conservatives. He's more, I think, I think I call him at one point in the podcast, a, a bloodless technocrat, which I hope he adds to his Twitter bio. Well, so here's the thing, right? This, this is kind of what I'm going through. Like, as I'm reading this bio, you know, uh, his research focuses on, you know, the effectiveness of cash transfers and alleviating poverty and how free markets can be complemented by robust systems of social insurance. That's what I believe plus social conservatism. Yeah. Hence how I arrive at New Deal conservatives. <laughs> and, and Nick has decided to get us permanently canceled by endorsing various part of FDR's program during this episode. So enjoy that and look forward to it. But uh, I think it was a fantastic episode. I think you'll learn a lot if you listen through all the way. Uh, if you don't know what the child tax credit is and you're expected to talk intelligently about it in daily life, this is the podcast for you. Um, I certainly learned a bunch of new things on this podcast. We think you guys will too. And so without further ado, we'll now go to Sam Hammond of the Niskanen Center. Sam, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. We always like to find out how people got to the point where they are now. You have a fun story of how you ended up being in American uh, political economic thinking. How did you end up doing this stuff? Yeah, so I, I mean, I was uh, born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada, Trailer Park Boys territory. Um, <laughs> you know, one of those classic uh, internet nerds. <laughs> so I spent a lot of my time sort of reading you know, libertarian philosophy. Um, I'm so sorry. Cons conservative, yeah, conservative. <laughs> like any teenager does. Yeah. yeah, conservative thinking. It was actually interesting. A lot of my own sort of firsthand experience has seen that kind of, you know, how, how you know, in Canada, really big figure like Stefan Molyneux, you know, transitions from being like very uh, focused on libertarian philosophy, like why we can privatize the roads and so forth to, um, you know, this, uh, where he is now. <laughs> say that. Um, but, uh, you know, always being really interested in, in, in uh, American public policy and just public policy in general. Um, broadly from a free market perspective, mm -hmm. and also really interested in like the George Mason University sort of ecosystem. Um, Were you a Tyler Cowen stan? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I read, read all his books in high school and so forth. Uh, and especially interested in like public choice economics, which mm -hmm. is sort of the economics applied to government. Um, and you know, so I did school in, uh, at Carleton in, in Ottawa, Canada. I was on track to have a career in Canadian public policy, but had the opportunity to go to George Mason University um, and work at Mercatus, uh, the research center there, uh, doing tech policy. Um, and from there, landed the role I'm in now, which is Director of Poverty Welfare at the Scanlon Center. And in, and sort of on the way, uh, shed many of my libertarian uh, dispositions, partly because, you know, going back to that public choice point, um, you know, often public choice gets used as 
uh, you know, this is why government fails. Um, and over time, I, I sort of came to think, well, maybe we should use some of these same concepts to understand how to make government not fail. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so a lot of people come to their policy interest area in D.C. through personal experience, like, you know, um, we have conversations with our guests a lot who have basically personal experience with the policy failing that they're trying to fix. What kind of led you into this? I mean, I'm not basically trying to ask you like, hey, were you ever poor? But <laughs> um, like, why, why did you get interested, you know, specifically in this, you know, I guess the study of poverty and how we can fix it? How do you get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think some people, especially in the poverty welfare space, they probably, you know, they have a bleeding heart. They really care about um, you know, poverty per se. Uh, for me, I came at it from a more analytical, you know, libertarians were all very, um, you know, forebrain, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, you had your charts. Yeah, and, and, you know, really trying to understand, you know, the transition from classical liberalism to like modern liberalism and why it happened, you know, why, uh, what, what changed with the Industrial Revolution? Because libertarians, you know, we have a great understanding of about why markets are fantastic, why economic growth is fantastic, why innovation is great. Um, but then also, you know, what kind of institutions have to change when technology changes. Um, and so that's where, you know, I, as I mentioned, I started in tech policy and really like uh, more on the, you know, what's the big innovative, you know, breakthrough technologies. I did, did a lot of work on um, the revival of supersonic flight, for example. And, you know, one of my convictions was, you know, the, take, take the China shock. Um, you know, whether or not we should have liberalized trade of China, um, those kind of economic labor market shocks are on some level inevitable, even if it's just domestic. Um, and you need to have systems in place to help people when they fall so they don't turn to SSDI or or, or worse or just exit the labor market altogether, um, that you don't have communities fall apart. And and really that's part of a broader sort of set of institutions, right? Retraining programs, reemployment supports. Um, and so that's really the approach I came at it from, sort of what you know, what are the conditions, what are the, the social insurance systems, the market uh, that, that complement the market and help the market work better, work for actual people, actual communities, um, so we can have that vibrant, innovative, dynamic economy that uh, we often talk about with entrepreneurship and so forth, but where if there are disruptions, which there inevitably are, um, that it's, uh, that, that ordinary people come out ahead. So presumably you, you have issues with the current regime in the United States when it comes to poverty, welfare, how we fill in the gaps when people may stumble. Uh, what are kind of the broad theoretical problems, the practical problems with the American welfare regime as it currently exists? Uh, there are too many to count. Other than I guess we have one, which is the traditional libertarian answer to this. Yeah, I mean, I should have a drink. Just yeah. Um, Every time the word libertarian comes up, everyone take a drink. Yeah, no, and we will I, die. I, I won't name who that was, but one of one of our mutual friends. I, I knew I was in the right place when uh, when they uh, said that we should have a um, a memorial honoring the the victims of libertarianism. Um, uh, yeah, so like take take the China shock. Um, uh, we have a program for people disrupted by trade. It's called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. It's been it's been treated historically as a kind of you know, afterthought. Um, we have to pass this trade deal. So the, you know, members of whatever the AFL-CIO lobby to have like a little add-on attached where we're going to, if, if you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you lost your job due to imports, then maybe we'll give you some retraining. <laughs> um, but you looked at like the China shock, which was devastating for, for many uh, places in the Midwest and South Atlantic. And, um, you know, SSDI was three times as responsive um, like when you go by a county. Sorry, what does SSDI mean? You Social that. Security Disability. Social so Security dis dis disability, disability yeah. insurance. More People were more likely, three times more likely to, you know, lose their job and turn to disability than they were to turn to the program that was purported to help people transition from a shock. You know, that's because we have a, you know, th this is just a microcosm of a bigger problem. But, you know, why does it matter if you lost your job due to trade versus, you know, Uber? Right. Like the, the t technology or the pandemic, you know, any kind of shock where you lose your job um, or where the demand for certain skills shifts is going to require some form of first a safety net to catch people before they fall. And then some way of, you know, using that safety net as a way to divert people from uh, exiting the labor force altogether and hopefully putting them on a path to uh, being productive members of society, ideally. Um, you know, through a variety of options, trades, apprenticeships, not just sort of this one track college education system we have. Um, but, but you know, in, in the case of TAA, 
you know, who can prove that they lost their job due to imports? Like that, you know, there there are like famous econometricians who, <laughs> who can't yeah. figure out who lost their job due to imports. So, you know, one of my, you know, ideas is to say, well, we have this unemployment insurance system, which is becoming very controversial now is uh, because it's been topped up to such an extent and people are, um, you know, reluctant to return to work after the pandemic. You know, what if we had a re-employment insurance system where instead of having a specific program for people disrupted by trade, we used UI as a way of saying, you know, anybody who has lost their job, if they can't find reemployment in a certain amount of time, if they're if they enter you know, the long term unemployment category, which is like 23, 24 weeks, that you're you automatically are able to get access to college programs, to on the job training and really just trying to build a more integrated system. Um, and this is the common theme across a lot of my work is that um, you know, my colleague Steve Tellis has this term kludrocracy. America is this is a kludrocracy where uh, anytime there's a problem, a new program is passed that just sort of papers over that, like a bandaid on that one thing. And across, you know, 70 years of this kind of stuff, uh, we have a very complex system. I think, you know, GAO, Government Accountability Office says that there are, uh, I think, 47 different employment and training programs in the federal government. Um, you know, maybe we need three, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but th those kind of like more comprehensive reforms uh, are hard to do in, in the American setup in, in Congress. Um, they're even harder to do because you have lots of special interest groups that are very narrowly focused. Like, you know, any one of those 47 programs probably has some benefactor who lobbies for just that specific program. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in my work, I try to be like the, uh, you know, to lean against that and to say, you know, how, how can we take a more comprehensive look at the system? And if we were to, you know, greenfield this thing and make it work better for everybody, uh, you know, what would it look like? Um, so I, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about my work on like child tax credits, stuff like that, you know, very similar sort of message, um, which is we have a myriad of programs all aimed to help families and children, um, but they've all just accumulated over time. It's not clear how, any, how effective any single one of them are. And really, we need uh, to step back once in a while, maybe every generation and say, how do we really make a um, make a set of institutions that is coherent and sort of meets the current technological economic moment. One of the things I really like about a lot of your work is that it's not like there is a type of work that you could do in this space that was like, here's what the ideal welfare regime would look like. And I think that's important. And I'd be very curious what country you think gets it best if you were to like say, that's what we want. But a lot of your work centers on like the realities of how politically we can change what we have now piece by piece into something that's better. A, what's the country that gets closest to your ideal vision of a social safety net? And then B, what's the low hanging fruit that we can adjust in the United States to make it as good? Yeah, um, you know, I do I do like to take an, a comparative approach in my work. Um, and I think that's something that is a little bit unusual in DC politics where you know, if, if it wasn't a pilot program in, in Wisconsin in like the early 1990s, it didn't happen or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and I, but there is a lot you can learn from looking cross nationally. I wouldn't say that that means that we can like become Denmark or anything crazy like that. Um, probably because I'm, I'm on some level a uh, historicist. Like I think that institutions follow a certain, you know, path dependency that, that, you know, anything, you know, anything that America becomes will have American characteristics you know, you know, irrespective of what you're, mm -hmm. you're aiming at. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I say rather than get to Denmark, let's at least like get to Canada or get to Australia or, or countries that have an Anglo sort of economic model. Right. But which, um, you know, on the margin do much better than the U S on social mobility, on economic opportunity, on, you know, having still some level of a union movement, um, that is like genuinely pro worker, not just pro, uh, technocrat. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the, one of the areas where I have tried to make an impact is, you know, Canada, Australia, these other Anglo countries have had universal or near universal child benefits for all their, all their citizens uh, in recognition that, um, you know, raising a family comes with extra expenses. The market does not automatically, you know, pay you more if you have kids. Um, and that if we care about, you know, building a society that is good, not just for profit, but for you know, raising a family, um, you know, maybe we should have something similar. Right. So that on the margin, that's that's something that I think the U.S. can and should do. Um, and especially if we can take a more comprehensive approach. So I, I did some work with uh, with Senator Romney on his Family Security Act, which is a proposal to create a kind of universal child allowance while paying for it by cleaning up many of these 
older programs, more bureaucratic approaches. Um, you know, so I think anything that can sort of sort of move the U.S. marginally in a direction where we're giving more resources to families of all backgrounds and stripes and taking the systems we have and, and trying to integrate them so that we don't have like 30 separate offices for this, that, or the other, that if you're um, low income or have lost your job, you're working class, uh, that you know you don't have to like spend down your assets to qualify for Medicaid or something like that. There's a whole series of issues in the US policy domain. Um, and so, you know, really, uh, you know, my job gets difficult in, in trying to figure out what to prioritize because there's just a lot that's sort of effed up. So there's been a lot of, uh, I don't want to call it division on the right, but I guess like difference of opinion uh, as to what, you know, whether it's uh, welfare pertaining to like poverty or to, you know, assisting slash incentivizing people to get married and have kids. I think there's, we've seen several different plans from like several different, you know, senators wanting to push some of this stuff, different dueling visions, mm. um, you know, for the future of the party and of the country. Um, I think there's probably an even like wider chasm probably between neoliberals on the left and, and, and progressives. But what are the, are the places and the, and the, and the policies that the right and the left can be working on together, uh, to, to kind of improve this sort of thing? Um, you know, in, where I worked in a scanning center, we're neither left nor right in, in that sense where, you know, some places are just on one team. We really try to take a transpartisan approach. And by transpartisan, I, I sort of mean something different than bipartisan. Right? <laughs> so, you know, my joke on this is, yeah. like, you know, bipartisan is when, you know, John McCain and Joe Lieberman go into a room and, and come out with a proposal to, like, increase, uh, you know, uh, detention centers or something like that. You want the other side of the horseshoe, basically. Right, exactly. Whereas transpartisan is when, you know, Mike Lee and AOC want to, like, decriminalize something or you yeah. know uh so you know with this you have to be you have to be creative i find in public policy um especially in congressional and national policy where uh you know some some organizations and you know all power to them are on a particular team they're trying to advance a particular mission uh the work i'm trying to do is trying to find areas where people can approach a policy with, from different values, but find something in common with it. So, you know, take the case of the family allowance or the child allowance. You know, Senator Romney um, or someone like Josh Hawley who's proposed similar things, and they approach it from a, a way of, you know, supporting families. Um, you know, there's good evidence that, um, that family allowances can uh, reduce rates of abortion, um, can uh, actually create more stable marriages. Uh, we've seen many reforms like this in, in Hungary. Uh, meanwhile, the left obviously comes at it more from an anti-poverty perspective. Um, and it's, that's all right. Like they're approaching it from different sides and different values, but they're converging on a policy that doesn't split the difference, right? That is, that coherently is both good for, po you know, relieving poverty and good for supporting families. Yeah. I, you use the term pluralism a lot in your work, I think. And, and that, that goes to, I think, an interesting approach to all of these questions, because I mean, I, I think sometimes a lot of this like political realignment stuff on the right can get too cute by half the idea that, you know, <laughs> oh, the right's realigning and we're going to team up with the far left. We're going to do all these great things together. Like, right. Well, that does happen. Right. So, like, yeah. you know, I don't work on tech, but obviously Josh Hawley and I don't know, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren, they probably agree more on, on big tech on certain ways and other things. So that's an, right. that's an example of a transpartisan issue, yeah. even if it's not one I work on. Right. But I, I think that there's there's probably a distinction. And the way I've been thinking about this is like on the tech issue is that Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley uh, don't agree on much on tech other than the fact that they don't like Google. And that's why antitrust is probably the easiest thing at hand, because if you don't like something, shattering it into a million pieces sounds pretty good. Right. Whereas like something like a child tax credit um, or, or a broader welfare regime, that that is truly about competing goods, not like what people hate the most. Um, it's it's about what what is the, the common good, even if you want right. to use a you know drink word. Um, <laughs> wh what are what are those goods that you think people are balancing on either side of the equation? And and where can they be in tension, you know, right and left? Oh, they're intentional all over the place. Obviously, the left right now cares a lot about, you know, these buzzwords around equity and inclusion and, and diversity, um, sort of the HR manual kind of kind of terms. Obviously, the right cares a lot about uh, liberty and freedom, um, but also authority, um, 
you know, family and the ab ability to, to practice your traditional beliefs, whether that's religious or not. Um, you know, I come at this as a Canadian in part, <laughs> uh, you know, in part because America always has had this myth mythos uh, um, as a melting pot, right? You come to America and you assimilate. Um, and that's, you know, in the data that remains true, immigrants who come here assimilate. But when we're talking about assimilation, we're, we mean, you know, do, do they enter the labor market? Do they, you know, get an education? Are, are they, uh, you know, becoming law-abiding citizens? That all, that part's all true. Um, but uh, in Canada, we take, sometimes it's been referred to as the mosaic as, as opposed to melting pot, where, you know, we, we don't try to, we want to have civic integration. We want people with different beliefs and different backgrounds to be part of a common, you know, civic community, but we're not going to, you know, make the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Sikh enclave in greater, the greater Toronto area, you know, become secular uh, humanists, <laughs> right? They're, <laughs> gonna, they're Sikhs, they're gonna, they're gonna do their Sikh stuff. Um, and that's good, right? And, and I think that's, uh, that concept of pluralism is a little bit missing in American discourse where, you know, we know something is wrong when the little sisters of the poor are f forced to, you know, buy, you know, IUDs, yeah. and stuff like For that. The fourth time, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we talk about that in, ter in terms of like religious liberty, yeah. but I think liberty is the wrong word for it because it is about liberty, but it's also about pluralism. Because there's a huge difference between, you know, um, having the choice over what you know 401k plan to invest in, right? That's a kind of like consumer choice. There's a huge difference between whether uh, you know a Muslim um, with very traditional religious beliefs is you know required to uh, go to a uh, you know, diversity training program that 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 sort of uh, runs afoul of everything they believe in, or something like that, right? So, like pluralism, I think, is almost ranks higher than than liberty in some sense because it's it's the liberty that matters the most. It's the it's the liberty over the over the the good the goods that are in dispute, right? Um, and I don't think you know, even if you think that there is some like way of adjudicating between different goods um, in a in a liberal pluralistic society, you ultimately have to you know take into account that. We're not going to persuade. We're not going to convince everybody. We're not going to have like one big consensus. We're never going to be, you know, Mao's China or, or as homogenous as you know Sweden or something like that. Um, and so you have to take pluralism really seriously. And that doesn't mean that you know, uh, that if you are a you know a center left technocrat or something like that, that and you're designing a policy um, that you know accommodates religious people with. Uh, who, with conscious uh, concerns or something like that. Um, that doesn't mean that you're like endorsing those views. You might even, you know, think that, you know, contraception or something like that is like super important. Um, but you should do it anyway. You should try to accommodate their views anyway, because you never know when you're going to be on the other side, other side of the table. And ultimately we have to all live together. Um, and to the extent that American culture and life right now is incredibly divided, um, they're divided over not, you know, the minimum wage or something like that. They're divided over these deep issues of what what do you consider the good life? Um, and there's only two ways to answer that issue, either pluralism or, you know, one team <laughs> has to win and dominate the others. And I don't think anyone wants that latter outcome. Yeah. So let's try to find some common ground then. Um, there's been a giant debate in 2021 over the child tax credit. You were obviously at the center of it with the policy that I think it'd be not inaccurate to say that you guys did with Senator Romney, like the scan and had a day zero kind of rollout on all of it. Um, first of all, what is the child tax credit? Um, <laughs> we have a lot of single unmarried people, uh, childless people who listen to the podcast who also may not actually know much about policy because no one in Washington really knows that much about policy. What is the child tax credit? Why is it important? And what are the different reforms on the table right now uh, for improving it? Yes, yeah, so the child tax credit. Um it goes back to the contract for America. Actually, it, it was uh, part of um, I think introduced in 1997, uh, really championed by Ralph Reed, and but even before then, um, you know, sort of part of this social conservative element of the conservative coalition to say if you're going to you know cut the capital gains rate, we should do something for families on the side, right? <laughs> um, and so that's that's really its origin. That's why it has had such transpartisan support for for so long. So it's been it's a uh, a refund on your taxes based on how many kids you have. So, you know, the most recent uh, major reform was during the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act under, under Trump. They increased it to $2,000 per kid. So if you owed a lot in taxes, every kid meant $2,000 off that. Um, and then there's a part of it that's refundable, which means even if you don't owe taxes, you still get some. 
Now, what other countries do, uh, in fact, every other country but the U.S., is they have very similar programs, um, but they're rather than treat them as a tax credit, they are just a benefit. So if you have kids, they're not neither deserving nor undeserving. Um, they are just a, a dependent effect of life. If you have kids, you get a certain amount. Um, you can do it monthly. And I think, you know, in the Netherlands, they do it quarterly. Uh, there's variation on, on a theme, but the idea is pretty straightforward. Um, and so, uh, you know, most recently, as part of the American Rescue Plan, the Biden administration uh, made the child tax credit fully refundable, which means, uh, you know, beginning uh, in July, um, families across America will be getting $3,600 per child um, under six and $3,000 per child uh, six to 17. Um, the Romney proposal was to, was, you know, I think this is why it caught people off guard, <laughs> was even more generous. It was to do $4,200 for kids under six and $3,000 $3, for, for older kids. Um, and do it to do it through the Social Security Administration to move it out of the tax code, where the tax code has become uh, kind of overused for all kinds of social policy, and to put it in a proper context as a like actual social insurance program, um, and to do it well, like cleaning up a, a variety of uh, more bureaucratic family support systems. So like TANF, TANF is um, is our traditional welfare system. That's temporary assistance for needy families, yeah, right? That's correct. what that stands for. Um, and you know TANF. Uh, it's TANF, uh, you know, practically speaking, the grants, they're grants to states, and it's mostly grants to, you know, New York and California. So uh, really, it's the program has become over the years, because it's shrunk over time, a kind of, uh, you know, federal grant in kind to to New York and California. So getting rid of it isn't the worst thing. But it also, you know, it it's also sort of the, a perfect example of, a, of how bureaucracy can trap people into poverty. Uh, you know, often people turn to those programs because they just had a kid. And they're not like poor, they're just broke. Right. And there's a huge difference on a sociological level between those two things. But if you get sucked into a poverty bureaucracy, you're given all these other benefits like housing and childcare uh, that have really steep benefit cliffs, you'll become mired in that. And then you will socialize into a different kind of poverty. Um, so one of the you know elements of a child allowance is just treating people with equal respect. Right. Um, I've called it sort of the bourgeois dignity of a child allowance to say, yeah. like, we're going to treat everyone just as if they're middle class. Yeah. So let's find some common ground. What is the child tax credit and what are the proposals on the table right now to reform it? It's It's been in the news all throughout 2021. Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, the child tax credit, it goes back to 1997. Um, it, it was part of the Contract for America. Um, and, that, and that origin is one of the reasons why it's always had robust Republican support. Ralph Reed was one of the champions of it. Um, uh, it really the kind of social conservative wing of tax reform. Um, and really the idea is to give parents with... Back when social conservatives weren't just satisfied with like capital gains tax cuts as like... Right. I mean, they still... I mean, really, they're only just starting to, you know, assert themselves. Even that was kind of, um, uh, you know, secondary. I, I have a whole other thing I could talk about on this. <laughs> we're, where... we're, we're one Supreme Court justice <laughs> away from overturning Roe v. Okay, right. Just one more. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we... Yeah, the 10th will do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the I mean, actually, so a funny story behind that. Uh, I wrote this article on um, Hungary's pro-family policies called uh, "Born in Hungary" for National Review. Um, and ever since, is that, that like a pun on "Born in the USA"? Uh, I did not write the title, so okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I do not know. But um, uh, ever since then, I've been invited to every single Hungarian embassy event, <laughs> as you can imagine. Oh yeah. yeah, you have a really good story about this. Don't name names of who you're talking about. I won't name names. Story? Yeah, I won't name names. Yeah. But um, well, it was. At this event, uh, they had the uh, Hungarian family minister speaking about all their pro-family policies, and they had a slate of people, um, some from the Trump administration, you know, just a who's who. Uh, I, I mean, I can name at least one name because all right, so it's go totally for it, go for it. Yeah. Name check. Well, it, I mean, Gorka. I mean, he is basically Hungarian, right? Um, yeah, he gave this like. A, pretty uh, pretty based speech if i do say so myself on like the how family is the foundation for civilization and stuff like that um and then afterward there was a panel where um you know a leader of the um uh, social conservatism in america the evangelical conservatism um said his you know his, his he was a gape you know his jaw had hit the floor 
just sort of astounded by all the pro-family policies that Hungary is implementing. And then he proceeded to say, well, you know, here in America, we take a small government approach. <laughs> right. So we can't a, have nice things here. Right. So was, that's socialism. Yeah. Nice things are socialist. Yeah. So it sort of short, sh showed me to what extent that part of the coalition had subordinated itself to um, kind of pro-business interests. Um, and I think that's starting to change, you know, partly because, you know, many of those pro-business interests are now Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the child tax credit is a, it's a tax refund for your kids. And over time, it's uh, it's grown. And most recently, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made it $2,000 per kid. So if you have a lot of taxes and you have a lot of kids, you get fewer taxes. Uh, but there's also a part that's refundable, which means that even if you don't owe taxes at all, you get it just the same. Um, and most recently, it was expanded as part of uh, the Biden administration's rescue package, um, really trying to make this a wedge issue, unfortunately. But um, I think it's also an issue that a lot, a lot of conservatives can find common ground on um, by making it fully refundable, which is to say that everyone with kids gets the same amount. Um, we're going to treat it the way we treat it in other countries, including Canada and, and uh, most of Europe, where um, rather than thinking of it as a tax cut, we're going to think of it as an actual benefit for having kids um, uh, paid monthly, right? And uh, what surprised a lot of folks back in February was when Senator Romney rolled out his own proposal, which was even bigger than the Romney <laughs> proposal or than the uh, Biden proposal, and which, uh, you know, would do it through Social Security Administration rather than the IRS, because the IRS is already overloaded of tons of other stuff. Um, and the Social Security Administration is where you would actually do this, because this really is a kind of Social Security for kids. Um, and with a myriad of other reforms, like there were going to, uh, the Romney proposal would pay for it in its entirety by abolishing for you know the state and local tax deduction, Democrats hate that. Um, getting rid of TANF, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families block grant, which is really really a you know a shell of its former self. Like our, our social service programs are, are um, really kind of in ruin, and and people who enter through those programs often end up being trapped in poverty through the, through the bureaucracies. Um, but also like getting rid of marriage penalties and the in the EITC and other other tax uh, provisions. Um, uh, you know, I think it was really actually kind of, uh, it sparked a really healthy discussion, let's put it that way. And I think there are um, still lots of conservatives trying to figure out how they think about this stuff, right? Um, you know, is money for nothing? You know, obviously there's been lots of uh, uh, interest in stimulus checks and stuff like that, but uh, an ongoing commitment to provide every family in America, every citizen family in America with uh, income support to help raise their kids and raise the next generation. Um, and so, you know, even people who sort of disagree around the edges, I think it really has tried to, it really has advanced the conversation where we're not sort of trapped in the 90s anymore and thinking just in terms of like welfare reform. I think most of the conversation has been great and very productive. And I think I've seen, you know, a lot of conservatives come the right way, I believe, on this issue, you know, supporting the family and um, particularly in middle, in the middle and lower class. But there certainly was a... Uh, a bit of a meltdown on small government conservative Twitter. Uh, <laughs> you know, there were there were plenty of people who shall remain nameless who said, this is the beginning of our slide into socialism like Venezuela. <laughs> and there are people who said, you know, this will is, we be eating rats, Sam? <laughs> yeah, like this. People who said, like, this is the beginning of a religious like theocracy like Iran. Like we we are <laughs> on our way there. Yeah. Um, Help us dispel just the ludicrous assumptions about this program. Why is it important, you know, that mm -hmm. we that we support people with children, uh, and why really should we claim it as a conservative issue? Uh, well, yeah, like, let me deal with this in in sequence. Um, you know, it is funny. Uh, you know, Poland with their Law and Justice Party uh, yeah. implemented a very uh, robust child allowance, and um, you know, cut you know, the the. The World Bank, you know, put a report saying, wow, Poland, you made tons of pro progress on child poverty. Like your child poverty rate has been slashed in half. And and because but because it's a conservative government that's doing it, um, you know, you, you, you can find many articles saying this is like creeping, you know, Handmaid's Tale or something like that. Democracy is <laughs> when liberals get what they want. When liberals don't get what they right. want, that's fascism. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I have a different. Uh, I've meant many, uh, I've written a lot of things about sort of how to think about big government. And I think there's the fiscal side where are we spending money? 
um, you know, what is government's footprint as a percent of GDP? And that can tell you something, but, you know, if, unless you're going to go for full like Grover Norquist and, and, you know, make your, your end goal sort of, you know, 18th, 19th century America, right? Like that's never going to happen. Um, then we have to take a more qualitative approach to what the government is. And, you know, the reason Venezuela has slid into catastrophe is not because they had like, you know, a robust family allowance. It's, it's, it's because they like destroyed markets and they had price controls and they nationalized industry. And that's really the kind of big government that matters, right? Um, so in this, in the case of a child benefit, um, you know, there's lots of evidence that reduces uh, rates of abortion. The um, Gutmacher has a survey that shows 28% of women who have had an abortion um, cite financial insecurity as their primary, primary motivation. Um, it, it diverts low-income people from turning to more bureaucratic poverty programs in which they can become trapped. Um, you know, TANF, the poverty program that, that uh, our, our main sort of welfare program, um, is for a lot of parents a kind of maternity leave of last resort. And you don't mm -hmm. want people turning to those things um, for that reason. And then thirdly, it, it, it offers, going back to this, this dis discussion we were having around pluralism, it sort of leaves paternalism to the parents, right? It, it's, we're not going to try to dictate the good life on what, uh, you know, whether you should be a two earner family or a single earner family of a stay at home mom. Um, we want to remain neutral to those things because they are very precious life decisions. And, you know, it's particularly become particularly relevant in the context of this emerging childcare debate where there's a question, you know, um, you know, do we want to have an enormous universal national daycare program um, in which, uh, you know, is basically designed from bottom up for the, the, du the dual earner college educated professional class family uh, that lives in big urban areas? Um, or do we want to put choice back in the hands of parents so they can use cash, something that's totally fungible, to, you know, have daycare out of their church basement, right? To support the stay-at-home mom to you know to compensate a relative um especially across rural america you know they don't have the population density to support like a big formal early childhood education center <laughs> um but biden's trying to change that they're they're pumping literally billions of dollars the child care stabilization fund on its own is i think nearly 30 billion dollars just going to formal daycare centers um and you know when we do have that you know when we do have a subsidized option for every parent in America to send their kid to um, be cared for by uh, well-credentialed uh, strangers, you know, there's there's benefits to that, but there's also costs, right? And I think, um, you know, for me, the costs are both on the, you know, on the actual policy side, like, do we need more credentialing, right? We're, we're in Washington, D.C. Um, a few years ago, Washington, D.C. passed a law requiring that their daycare workers have a two years associate's degree. <laughs> right. Like we've been, you know, evolving uh, on this earth for 300,000 years as homo sapiens. Like I'm pretty sure we know how to raise kids without having, you know, a college education. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but, you know, uh, the other issue is you need to know critical race theory in order to <laughs> raise well, a child. And you must be able to teach it to, uh, to children. Basically. Right. But this is this is this, the other side, which is less policy and more um, uh, more politics and culture, which is. You know, when you do have something like a universal daycare program, there will inevitably be fights over who sets the standards. What are what kind of curricula are we teaching? Because this isn't just daycare anymore. It's not early child education, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and what does that actually mean in practice? Like, yes, sir. I'm sure there is a lot of merit to you know reading to your kids and giving them stimulation that's that's uh, more valuable than what screens or something like that but reading what <laughs> right yeah how to be anti-racist baby Cicero right? or like how to be an anti-racist baby that's right yeah exactly <laughs> and, and you know um I, I think it's fine for you know a very woke family to send their kids to that system right if they want to just just like i think it's fine for a catholic family to send their kids to catholic school um but we should recognize that just because one family is secular they're, they're no less you know sectarian right mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if we had a degree of social trust like they would have in other countries, you know, maybe you can do something like that. But you can't do that in America. We are a very diverse society. We have to respect that diversity. We have, you know, Mormons in Utah and the Amish in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's lots of var variation. And, you know, uh, we can't just appro approach it as a purely technocratic issue, which is how a lot of this stuff gets discussed. It gets dis discussed in terms of, you know, what are female labor force participation rates? How do we, you know, boost GDP? Um, and it's not that I'm against boosting GDP. I just think you have to understand how many of these programs are incredibly value-laden in, in a way that is very alienating to 
many religious conservatives. So to ask uh, uh, just an important, I think, clarifying question about the child allowance in particular, uh, and you, you know, you probably have to speak to, to Romney's plan in particular because that's the one that you and Niskanen ostensibly were, you know, involved in crafting. But is the child allowance intended to support people who already have children like it's it's kind of meant as a part of this rescue package right because of coronavirus or is it something that is also meant to support you know people in the future who are or maybe think like is it meant yeah. as an incentive yeah or just a support measure for right now well both right so um you know there's the political dimension to this right so you know one of the reasons i put my attention behind this is because in canada in the early 2000s there was um we had a populist movement of our own. We were talking before uh, we hit record about you know, Western Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a movement of, uh, that their motto was sort of the West wants in. It was yeah. a very populist um, because... Uh, you the know, golden days yeah. of Western Canada. <laughs> very populist sort of... Imagine taking any tea of this part, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, it has a lot of lessons for American conservatives because it kind of did prefigure many of the things behind the Tea Party and then later behind Trump. Yep. Um, and, you know, they were re really reacting to uh, what we call like the Laurentian elite, mm -hmm. people who went to school on near you know, the U of T or McGill schools near the St. Lawrence River are called Laurentian elite, just like we have in America, sort of elite. The Acela Corridor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, and at the time, the that's that populist movement split the party, right? The conservative party uh, sort of disintegrated and uh, in sort of the same way that we're seeing now uh, in the, on the American right, although uh, because of the political system, parties don't break up that easy. Um, but, you know, uh, Stephen Harper in 2006 won election campaigning on an agenda of trying to rebuild the party around a common policy agenda, right? Um, and one of the things that they passed was this universal child allowance in 2006. And it's like, here's a conservative government doing something that is, you know, objectively pro-poor, like it's helping poor families, but it's also helping working class families, it's helping middle class families it's because it's universal. And it's sort of extolling this broader message of we're doing this qua family. You know, we're, you know everyone gets it qua being kids and having, um, you know, progeny. Um, and it really helped bring the party together. It brought together the populists um, because, you know, checks, got me some checks. <laughs> yeah. uh, it brought together the libertarians because they didn't want bureaucracy. And at the time, the uh, Liberal Party in Canada was proposing a national day daycare program. Um, and it brought together the social conservatives because it was something that was objectively pro-family. Now, um, in the US context, you know, I think a lot of the debate is sort of anchored to the 1990s and the welfare reform debate. Um, and that was a very particular issue, right? There was, we had an old welfare program called AFDC uh, that came out of the mother's pension program. Mother's pensions were for, um, you know, widows re for, whose uh, hus husbands didn't return from war. They had kids. It was at a time when women weren't expected to work. Um, so as such, the program didn't, you know, wasn't structured to encourage work. <laughs> so we sort of, it was, it was a created dependency by design, right? Um, because if you earned a dollar on that program, you would lose a dollar in benefits. Um, and so we've, we've kind of learned the, the wrong lesson from that where, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the fact that there was a welfare program per se that was tra tra uh, trapping people out of work. It was the fact that if they worked, they lost their benefits. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and a universal program doesn't have those problems. Um, and especially one in which it by dint of being universal, we kind of treat everyone as if they're sort of have the aspirations and the potential to be part of this big bourgeois middle class. Um, and and I think it's really important going back to the child care issue. Uh, you know, ever since the Great Society, there has been this attitude on the left of, you know, trying to attach spending programs to particular interest groups, right? Whether it's sort of the liberal legal network and you know, much of the civil rights stuff is is really downstream of, um, uh, you know, public interest law firms and legal activism. But then also in the social policy dimension, uh, you know, if you can pass a big child care bill that gives a ton of money to, you know, what the one of two, you know, uh, nationally accredited credentialing agencies mm -hmm. then, and then you build a constituency yeah. right and um and that makes those things really sticky and it also means that they're uh they're not really trying to build a platform a more universal kind of structure they're trying to really benefit parochial interest groups um and that's something we really have to push 
push get, uh, back against. And also, you know, be really careful when we're talking about big government, what we really mean. Do we care about Social Security and Medicare? Is that, you know, obviously there's problems in Medicare with cost. Um, but you often hear, like, keep your government hands off my Medicare. Like, <laughs> what, what is that? What is that getting at? It's getting at this idea that there's a huge difference between a you know, relatively efficient retirement system versus, you know, imagine if we went into Social Security and said, um, no, you're not going to get your your uh, uh, regular uh, Social Security income. Instead, we're going to give you a voucher for your nursing home. And, <laughs> and, and here's an EBT card and you can only buy, you know, the nicest uh, fresh green groceries. <laughs> you know, people would revolt, right? Because, you know, those might end up benefiting particular interest groups. But um, a, a, univer a relatively universal program like Social Security can't be tampered with in that way. So, so talk to me about universality a little bit. Uh, I've been very influenced by a particular heuristic that Matt Brunig has used a lot, which is like trapezoid welfare. Programs. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, people have this kind of, I think, instinctual justice oriented framework that, oh, rich people shouldn't be getting right. a given benefit. I mean, this was literally a major theme uh, in Hillary Clinton versus Bernie Sanders in the 2016 presidential primary. Uh, Hillary Clinton was running on a trapezoid style benefit when it came to free college because he said, I don't want Donald Trump's kids getting free college. What's the, first of all, what's the distinction between universal and a non-universal program? And B, why, why do people get so hung up about it? And why shouldn't they? Yeah, it's a case where, um, sort of the horseshoe theory in the bad sense rears its head, where you have folks on the left who really only care about targeting things on um, on the poor because they take a, a uh, you know more egalitarian framework. They're trying to basically redistribute. And then you have folks on the right who will say, you know, you know, we're fiscal conservatives. We don't want to spend we don't want to waste money on people who don't need it. So, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, programs like Medicaid or whatever are for the truly needy, right? Um, and, you know, I think what implicit in that model is a kind of resignation to having a very bifurcated labor market and bifurcated society. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's very distinct from the kind of FDR New Deal kind of vision where we're going to create like these broad based programs that, that potentially benefit everybody. Because at the time, um, you know, especially with the headwinds um, or the tailwinds from, um, you know, the investments in uh and military equipment and manufacturing uh, during World War II, you know, we came out of that with a ro very robust middle class, right? And so you're trying to build sort of bedrock uh, social insurance systems for that middle class versus, you know, post 70s style great society programs where, um, where there is a very bifurcated system where you have upper class and an underclass, and we're just going to use transfer programs to uh, you know, paper over the underclass. We're not going to try to, you know, restore a robust middle. Um, and moreover, because people in the underclass don't really know what's good for them, we're going to make sure that, that we have, you know, people with good credentials and, you know, master's degrees in education policy or whatever to, to, to really social engineer, right? Um, and I think those are two very different visions of the America that we want. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I've, you know, I think people should, I think conservatives need to make peace with a, a version of the New Deal based on this notion of having a robust middle, right? Um, and really try to go to war and, and draw clear distinctions between that vision and the kind of more uh, technocratic great society vision where we're going to, you know, give uh, uh, credentialed special interest groups tons of handouts and, and in-kind benefits um, to basically entrench this very bifurcated society that we have, and it's only becoming more bifurcated. And it causes a political dysfunction too, right? I mean, right. the universal the program of, is a lot harder to yeah. abolish. It's a source of this kludocracy that I mentioned, right? Well, and here's the thing is that, I mean, this, this kind of praise of, you know, whether it be FDR or the New Deal is like, I mean, it's like a dirty word in conservatism, right. you know, like I've, I was reading this, uh, you know, fellow Canadian, uh, Conrad Black, his biography of, uh, of FDR it took me like a month and two days to finish because it's, you know, very long. And so chunky book. Yeah. So people, <laughs> people are always asking me like what I'm reading. I normally get through a book a week and I was taking like a really long time on this one. And so I talked about it a lot and almost universally on the right. The response was, ugh, 
Like it doesn't even matter if 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 you know the people were ideologically aligned, uh, you know, with what we're doing at American Moment. Like generally, the the, right. the response from the right has been to shun that, to shun the New Deal, to to shun FDR. Um, what would you say is is you know like the replacement for this like vocabulary about free markets is the solution to everything and pulling everyone up by their bootstraps? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's an overhang, an institutional overhang, in uh, American conservatism. Um, you know, up whether it was Eisenhower or Nixon, you know, up up until Reagan, people had broadly made peace of that, <laughs> that New Deal vision, right? And I think there was an effort to really try to reverse it. And um, you know, this goes back to my initial comments, but sort of the memorial, the victims of to the victims of libertarianism. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, there 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 is a there's real there, there you have to really pr- try to understand what do people want what do conservatives like rank and file conservatives want do they care about you know government as a percent of gdp per se you know they want they want taxes that are low fair and simple right they don't mm-hmm. they want government out, out of their life um on a sort of phenomenological level like do they have to file quarterly taxes and stuff like that and how do you do that without you know having some understanding of the machinery of government. You need to actually understand how it works. You can't be anti-government per se. Uh, you know, I think this goes to um, a point Michael Lind has made repeatedly, which is, uh, you know, take something like the, the Trump administration, um, setting aside the administration itself, you know, it, it was less effective than it could have been because it was more a counterculture than a counter-establishment, right? Mm. Um, and so you need to understand how that establishment works and have, you know, the folks that you're recruiting and so forth be part of that establishment uh, to actually affect change. And part of that is also, you know, understanding that government is just a tool and it be, can be used for good and ill. Right. Um, so, you know, I think on some level, pluralism works better through that more more broad based vision, whether you want to connect it to FDR or not. And uh, it's very clear whether it's big tech or or, um, or or trade or these other issues that the conservative base isn't, you know, a Charles Koch libertarian. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but nor are they a Elizabeth Warren social Democrat, right? They're something different. And um, what that vision really was, you know, what, what, you know, my sense is, is that it is more reflective of a kind of FDR style of uh, conservatism, actually, which is pro worker, pro working class, um, not pro, you know, Great society where it's going to redistribute the gains and and let right. you stagnate, but trying to build a society that has this big middle, right? This this big robust bourgeois that can resist the kind of overclass. Our friend Orin Cass uh, loves to you know when people ask him, oh, do you want government to be bigger or smaller? And he's just like, put aside that question. I want it to be differently shaped. Exactly. Um, yeah. But I I guess on net, where do you stand? Do do you think that and and I think you brought up an interesting way of, of maybe distinguishing even the bigger or smaller question because how people feel how big the government is is a related but but distinct question from how big it actually is. So let's use the example of how much money it spends. Should the federal government of the United States be spending more money or less on net? I think it's like a, a ill-phrased question, right? Like I'm, it, <laughs> yeah, be a better <laughs> podcaster, sir. No, I mean, I mean, these are questions that people have, but it's... It's not like there's a fact of the matter. It's, you know, that that's a really a fiscal policy question. Like, are we in a recession? Do we want to have a bigger deficit? Yada, yada, yada. You know, I do think that governments have to pay for their bills at some point. Um, that all that, that's all very true. The, you know, the question is, are we paying for our bills at a high level or a low level? You know, I think, um, again, America will never be Denmark. We're not about to have, you know, a 20 percent value added tax. <laughs> uh, so you have to sort of work within those constraints, work within part of the American history and, and the American sort of constitution in the in the personality sense the, the, the constitution of americans and so every anything you're going to design is going to have you know american characteristics but what i really think we need to do is not just set aside the how big question uh, and also not even the you know how differently designed or differently allocated question but but really think about this in terms of like nation building per se right you know why people like Lincoln or, or or FDR is because they were ultimately a kind of nation builder, right? There was a 
epic moment of transition and they had to construct new institutions, right? And not only new, new institutions, but like clean out the rot that was already there um, and make things work just better, right? And I'm gonna start using that as a phrase, by the way. Like, I'm pro nation building, but for us, <laughs> right? Like, not, I mean, that's like a classic Barack Obamaism, right? Like, we need to do nation building at home. Like, and I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just it's it's a line that people have used before. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, there's nation building when you topple a government and then like have to pick up the pieces. That 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 doesn't end up working very well. But I'm talking more in the sense of, you know, we have many institutions uh, that were designed in the post war period. that are clearly running on fumes. And it's affected academia. It's affected, you know, we had, I've been a little bit involved in the debate around um, R&D funding and, and our science agencies, which have become very sclerotic. And so up and down the board, like it's clear that American institutions are not really firing in all cylinders. Um, and that's not a question of pouring more money at the problem. It's also not a question of just pure austerity. It's a question of how do we actually get these institutions to be high functioning, right? Mm -hmm. I'm one could potentially accuse you of sort of being more technocratic in your affect. You know, you're, you're interested in moving the dials of policy in potentially a slightly bloodless way. But I'm curious what... <laughs> Man, that's... Feel free, feel free to refute that. If he's calling like, Kettle Black. He's, he, yeah, he's, he's going to put that in his Twitter bio. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's going to be the thing. Yeah, b a bloodless technocrat. There you go. <laughs> but I guess I'm curious, 10,000-foot uh, view, what to you are the threats, the existential threats facing the United States in the next 20 to 30 years? Oh, 20, 30 years? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, that's a lot. There are so many. <laughs> well, I mean, there's just a lot of technology that's that's going to be very different. Um, you know, I think there, the next century will be defined on some level by, uh, you know, this actually kind of ancient tension between, um, you know, liberty and, and public order, right? We, you, you saw this already with the pandemic, right? Like, um, you know, Taiwan did a much better job on some levels managing the pandemic because even though they're, they're a democracy, but, um, you know, they had quarantines in place to, you know, put people uh, against their will, you know, behind bars, you know, in a hotel room or whatever for 14 days or whatever. Like America is not ever going to, that's never going to fly in America. But at the same time, you also have, you know, information technology that's making, that's, that's exposing the corruption across all kinds of institutions from government to corporate America to, you know, you know, the inner marriage details of Bill Gates and stuff like that. And that anytime, you know, someone gets shot in the street, the, the video is going to go viral. Um, and those that creates a, you know, what Martin Gurry has called the revolt of the public, right? Whether it, you know, it started with, you know, Tunisia and the Arab Spring, um, moving up to Brexit and Trump on some level. Uh, but then also riots in Paris and stuff like that. And I think all this stuff will only continue to escalate and accelerate until um, institutions of government and, and corporate America and, and other institutions um, reset around those new, new realities, right? Like, I think you're seeing this already with, with the kind of politicians that are rising in America right now. It's, it's people like, you know, Ron DeSantis or AOC or Donald Trump, folks who uh, have a kind of authenticity about them. Um, and I think that's partly a function of being in a more digital age, right? And, you know, if there is like some breakthrough in AI or something like that and, and shit just hits the fan <laughs> and there's, uh, you know, our institutions just sort of, the, you know, their gears seize up, right? Um, it, it's going to get rough and it's, you know, it's going to require, um, uh, people to be ready to, um, you know, anticipate and and opportunistically like take the that big transition in a way that's more healthy and productive um but you know that's the thing i'm most worried about it's it's sort of that tension between public order and 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 having institutions like we need institutions right i know america has a very sort of protestant ethic under, undergirding <laughs> it and we don't like yeah, institutions okay, we don't okay. we don't like being mediated but ultimately need some kind of mediation but it has to be media mediation that everyone buys into right and if you're being mediated by literally the media and you don't trust anything they say um you know maybe that gives rise to new new media like we're seeing happen um, i think that's going to happen across a variety of different domains and the powers that be that the incumbents that are losing out are going to be crying the whole way. Um, but what comes out the other end will look very different, but will ultimately be more congruent with where the public is at. You heard it here first, folks. Sam Hammond says it's going to get worse and uh, <laughs> you should build your cabin in the woods and buy some ammunition. Um, so as the uh, resident 
I guess diet Canadian. That's the yeah, that's the that's yeah. the lexicon that you, you hail from Minnesota. Um, <laughs> as a resident Canada fan, diet Canadian, amateur historian, whatever. Um, it's I'm gonna get one more Canada question in. Okay, uh, you've previously you know worked for the government of Canada, or at least that's what my notes tell me. Um, <laughs> what do you think that the U.S. can learn from Canada on these issues? And like really actually learn because a, a lot of Americans, I mean, even in DC in particular, like to make fun of Canada. And I mean, I do too on occasion. Um, it's, it's a pretty they easy place to make fun of. <laughs> uh, but what, what like practically and actually can American policymakers here in DC, you know, young people who are maybe in their first or second job on the Hill, what can they learn from the way uh, that Canada has done business over the last couple of decades? Yeah, I mean, there's many things. Um, I've, I've already mentioned the kind of different approach to multiculturalism, where we we have an actual sort of actual multiculturalism, right? Not not this kind of monoculturalism. Yeah, right? I mean, I disagree with that take. So, uh, like, let's move on to the next one after. That. Yeah, I, mean, I think that is really important, though. Um, and it's you know, in the in the Canadian civil service, that kind of um, you know liberal neutrality or pluralism is really strong, right? It's it's. You know, uh, until relatively recently, if you were a senior official in government, you couldn't even belong to a political party, right? Um, and that's sort of a trade-off with having an administrative state, right? Like, uh, so Canada shows that, like, if you want to have a high-functioning, high-trust government, some of those norms have to really be strong and in place. So that's one thing. Um, you know, take the take immigration. I think you know I, I can't speak too much about immigration policy because it's not my my lane, but. Um, you know, Canada really proves that uh, a points-based system, one that's rooted in sort of national interest and national economic interest, um, can support high rates of immigration. That's good for the good for the country, good for the economy, but also has lots of popular buy-in. In part because, in part because we have a sense that there's like we control it, right? There's a huge difference between having a million people come in every year um who are unaccounted for and you're not really sure what's going on versus like a, yeah. a, a controlled flow well, yeah I mean, you they, have it a lot easier because you don't have like a porous southern border right i mean yeah. theoretically you could like that's part of it but that's yeah. that's american celebrities keep threatening to go to canada <laughs> yeah no i think that's that's a little bit overrated it's it's um you know obviously in the u.s most of undocumented immigration is visa overstays right it's, it's not people waltzing across the border um it's really but it comes down to you know having a immigration system that you know a has you know a ton of control a ton of, you know very strong employment verification and stuff like that um and, but b is sort of understood to be in the national for the national interest right um uh and really you know we canada draws from like the world's middle classes like we have like um you know different every every other every other country's middle class has a has a enclave in canada and and that has helped create that kind of bourgeois middle so I think at some level, like actually a, a more liberal immigration policy with the right um, guidelines and the right things it's selecting for could actually help, uh, you know, fill in the the hollowed out parts of America <laughs> like the, that have become uh, very uh, barbell shaped, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that Canada also shows the importance of of regionalism. Um, you know, na our politics are much less national than they are in the United States, partly because we're very federalized, like provinces kind of run everything. Um, uh, and I think that would be much healthier for America to have some more genuine sort of, more genuine federalism. And it, and you know, part of that is is understanding what, what are the conditions for federalism to work well. Um, you know, in the case of Canada, we have very robust um, revenue sharing between the provinces. So, um, so provinces are actually able to fund the programs that they're tasked with funding right uh and in america there are over like 100 federal grant programs um and they're all for the most part very highly skewed towards blue states that have the most spending power right and so you run into the situation where oh you know we want you know maybe you're a classics or a david french kind of, kind of conservative and you just want like you think state rights is the answer to everything and, and we should just push you know healthcare or whatever back to the states well you're going to run into problems because mississippi has double the poverty rate is Massachusetts, right? And actually Mississippi, Massachusetts have very similar tax uh, structures. They both have a 5% top marginal income tax. They both have a 5% sales tax. But Mississippi raises half the revenue per capita as Massachusetts because they're just much poorer, right? Um, so federalism is a big piece. I think, you know, 
the right could do a better job of trying to articulate what an agenda would look like around not not using federalism as sort of like a as a uh, uh, formulae response to something to say, well, let's just leave it to the states, but to say, how do we actually structure the, pro like the federal setup to make it possible for states to actually have a bigger role in structuring policy? Um, and then, uh, you know, not being, uh, you know, taking efficiency is, efficiency is not the right word, but like, you know, Americans are very ideological, <laughs> whether you're left or right. Um, and, you know, we could all use a, a healthy dose of just raw pragmatism. Um, you know, part of this goes to, you know, the American Revolution, having a very idealistic utopian uh, sort of founding. Uh, Canada obviously doesn't have that. We still uh, have plenty of royalists. <laughs> and I know you that... You got the leftovers from the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a loyalist to myself, so, you know, uh, God save the queen. But, uh, you know, there's there's not really there's never really been a genuine conservatism in America on, on that level, on that kind of British style Tory uh, Toryism. And, you know, this goes to uh, unease about big government. Like Canada has this very um, famous tradition of red Toryism, uh, sort of big government conservatism. That's all missing in America because we tend to in America link conservatism very closely to the founding, which is which is great. But um and obviously, like I said before, everything has American characteristics that will that will be coming uh, in the future. But um, but to be a little bit more pragmatic about what that actually entails, right? Like if we're going to be pro FDR, pro Lincoln, at least on some margins, it's going to have to require um, you know understanding that uh, uh, you know we can't just leave everything to the courts. Basically, <laughs> we have we can't we can't you know get to uh, get back to 1776, uh, at least not like that. Um, and we really have to work with the cards we're dealt, right? And um, and that's always been much more prominent in, in Canadian thinking. Sam, this has been very thoughtful. Where can people learn more about the stuff that you're doing at Niskan and learn more about you, learn more about the ideas you're talking about? Uh, NiskanCenter.org, and I'm Ham and Cheese on Twitter. Ham and Cheese. Is there a backstory <laughs> to that? <laughs> uh, just an old internet handle. I yeah. joined Twitter in 2007. Yeah. Early, early. Uh, I could have got better, better handle. Okay, real for real. <laughs> this is our last question. Do you ever get people that DM you asking to buy your handle? And if so, how much have you been offered? Never in my life. Really? No, no one has ever offered to buy Are you uh, making an offer right now? Are you like 20 bucks? <laughs> no, no deal. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> That's sweet. Think Tank money is enough. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This week, we wanted to highlight on Amcanon a really cool piece by a friend of the podcast, Julius Krein. Uh, actually, I don't know Julius personally, but American Affairs is definitely a friend of the podcast. So acquaintance of the Acquaintance podcast. of the podcast. Um, uh, it's called, Can Conservatism Be More Than a Grudge? Um, and in it, he uh, I think he wrote it for like the publication of the Harvard Kennedy School. And in it, he talks about uh, basically something that we've talked about a lot on this podcast, which is what the status quo of sort of power balance is in American life right now, which is that essentially the Republican Party over the last 20 to 30 years has been a, I think he uses the term, rent-a-party, where its quote-unquote principles, usually economic libertarian, libertarianism, are utilized by various economic interests in order to further their pure bottom line corporate gains when uh, the entire ethos underlying the party, an ethos that would theoretically support social conservatism, thriving society, human flourishing, are left by the wayside. I think it's a fantastic piece, and it goes to a lot of what we talked about just now on the podcast with Sam, which is the idea that we we have to have an actual positive agenda if we're going to govern as conservatives, as even social conservatives. Uh, and that relates to all sorts of things, including poverty and welfare. It relates to things like industrial policy um, and, and, and what the shape of government looks like. You may think the government needs to get way smaller, but there's still choices to make when it comes to how big, or well, what the shape of the things it does is. And so I think it's an extremely uh, important concept to think about, like how 
uh, your values as a conservative have been weaponized over the last 30 to 40 years to basically underwrite the interest of corporate America, when in reality, there's real values that can be underwritten. Yeah, well, and I think this is uh, this has been a big problem, you know, with uh, the public appeal of conservatism and of the Republican Party is that we've, you know, traditionally kind of been the party of no, just like, no, no, no. We're not going to do this like it would help you, but we're not going to do it because it's socialism or whatever. Um, and I think that Donald Trump did something differently. Now, he still, you know, had his moments of, of no, no, no. But I don't think you traditionally would have seen, uh, you know, a conservative president supporting something like the stimulus checks, you know, or, or, or other things like that. And so I think that moving forward, our party needs to find kind of proactive solutions to these problems, uh, problems that normal people outside of the beltway, outside of blue states are having. Yeah, I think that's basically right. And um, if the path to actual popular victory is there, like by doing good and popular things, uh, conservatives can actually govern again in America. It's, 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 it's why we can't have nice things right now. You don't have to be shackled down by the chains of corporate slavery. That's a phrase we used in a piece we wrote together in American Greatness not mm -hmm. too long ago. You can actually advocate for an agenda that substantively uh, improves the chances of strong families, a sovereign nation, and prosperity for all being dominant. You should do things that are good, and you should not do things that are bad. That's that right. That is the I that's am for our policy. good things and against <laughs> bad things. That is the policy of American moment, and we hope it's your policy as well. Um, as always, please make sure to rate and subscribe to the podcast. We have tons of new ratings coming in every week. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, if you rate five stars and you leave a fantastic question uh, or even a, a mediocre question in uh, your question, uh, your review on uh, on Apple Podcasts, we will answer it on the podcast. Um, it may take a little bit because we're actually banking quite a few episodes right now. But uh, we think that, um, you know, we, we love to get feedback from our audience. We've improved the podcast because of some of the things. In fact, even Sam Hammond has uh, been a huge influence on me uh, lightening up a little bit. I think he says, it, it's a boomer reference, he says, less Howie Carr, more Howard Stern, I think is what he says. Yeah, Something whatever. like that. Whoever those <laughs> boomers are, I think he's telling us to lighten up. He, he promised us that he would wear a Hawaiian shirt when he came to tape, and he never actually did that. He so. reneged on that deal. Yeah. And he also, so, you know, we've been trying to release on Twitter uh, usually a, uh, a little promo of the speaker speaking to camera and saying that they're going to be in the podcast next week. He straight up could not get through like one sentence of that. So uh, presumably uh, you'll, you'll just see this drop right away on the Monday that it comes out. Um, but yeah, once again, review, go to AmericanMoment.org, find everything about us send us some money if you'd like uh, and tune in next week on moment of truth thank you for listening moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is a minor struggle by ryan serenich don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms and you can go to americanmoment.org to learn more